Welcome, everybody. My name is Michael Suarez. I have the great privilege of being the executive director of Rare Book School and of introducing our speaker this evening. Uh, our lecture today is um, very graciously sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities and um, part of a grant that we wrote some time ago uh, called the Global Book Histories Initiative. We've been really working since 2014 to make a Rare Book School uh, more diverse in its collections, more diverse in its student body and faculty, and, and more authentically global in its offerings. The world of the book is a big, capacious world. And uh, the more that we enlarge the audiences for the study of book history and bibliography, the stronger I believe we're going to be in the long term. Uh, we are so privileged today to, to have with us uh, Professor Dorothy Wong, who is a world expert on Buddhist art produced in China during the first millennium of the Common Era. In addition to many, many articles, she has authored or edited five published books with a sixth on the way, uh, including Chinese stele, pre-Buddhist and Buddhist use of symbolic form, Buddhist pilgrim monks as agents of cultural and artistic transmission, and miraculous images in Asian traditions. I'm just hitting some of the points here, or we'd, you'd be hearing me instead of hearing Professor Wong. The reviews of these volumes are truly splendid. As one scholar writes of Buddhist pilgrim monks, this is a splendid introduction to a vast subject written with such precision that it will surely become a basic reference. While another opines, Dorothy C. Wong's ambitious new book is our best resource for making sense of this important style of Buddhist art in East Asia. This elegant monograph successfully illuminates the multifaceted ways in which Buddhist images traveled between monasteries and royal courts through the peregrination of monks. Uh, many of us would give one of these arms to have a review like that. Uh, Dorothy Wong is Professor of East Asian Art and Director of the East Asia Center here at the University of Virginia, where she's currently working with some two dozen scholars to research the topic of miraculous images in global perspectives, trying to understand what miracles might mean in different cultures and how and when people ascribe material objects with spiritual agency. A fascinating subject. Among her many honors, and I am giving you a very truncated list, Professor Wong has been Foreign Research Fellow at the International Wutai Institute of Buddhism and East Asian Culture in China, a Henry Luce Fellow at the National Humanities Center, and a Bunting Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. We are deeply, deeply privileged to have her with us today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Wong. Thank you very much, Michael, for that kind introduction. I don't really know if I really deserve all the praises. Um, as England just completed the four-day celebration of Queen Elizabeth II's Platinum Jubilee, I am reminded of the Queen's royal presence in the Dome Room in 1976 during UBA's bicentennial. 
So I am very honored to have been invited to speak, to give a rare book school lecture in the same room. I'm not yet 96 years old. <laughs> Although in my talk, I will discuss a remarkable imperial woman in Chinese history. From the seventh through the middle of the eighth century, or the first half of the Tang Dynasty in China. This period represented a phase of material and cultural efflorescence. Elements of Tang civilization, from political, social, and economic institutions to philosophy, religious beliefs, arts, literature, were emulated in vast territories of East Asia, especially the Korean Peninsula and Japan and to a limited extent in Central Asia and, and Vietnam as well. But during this time, Buddhism was already on its decline in India, but the religion spread across East Asia, particularly in the form of Mahayana Buddhism that advocated salvation for all and the salvific character of a vast pantheon of Buddhas bodhisattvas, and other saintly figures. Because of the expansion of a Sinophone region under the influence of the Tang, Buddhist art and material culture were characterized by a uniform visual style across the region that can be called cosmopolitan. The rich records of Buddhist material culture demonstrates the use of a broad range of materials and methods in production. There were sculptures made of wood, metal, stone, dry lacquer, and two-dimensional images and Buddhist narratives on wall murals, textiles, paper, and embroideries. Buddhist sacred scriptures were translated into Chinese and copied on paper and silk, and eventually printed. A key teaching in Mahayana Buddhism encourages devotees to to do good deeds, to accrue merit or good karma toward ascension in the cycle of birth and rebirth. Devotional acts that can generate merit include the making of stupas or the Buddhist relic mount, monuments, Buddhist images, recitation of Buddha names in repentance rituals, or copying of sutras. The merit accumulated can be for oneself one's relatives for the country or transferred to others in present and future times. Devotees of a broad social background donated at the level they could afford to express their piety. The call to dedicate vast quantities of devotional objects in turn spurred innovations in techniques that were precursors to mass production and printing. In this talk, I will examine the religious and cultural context of the period with a focus on certain practices and the evidence of efforts to replicate or mass produce Buddhist images and writings. Most specifically, I will focus on two individuals who played significant roles in disseminating Buddhism in China and beyond. The first one is the celebrated translator and pilgrim monk Xuanzang. He made a 16-year journey to India by way of Central Asia. As one of the greatest translators of Buddhist scriptures, his work was invaluable in making Buddhist teachings accessible in Chinese, a written language used in East Asia, including Korea and Japan at that time. For those interested in Chinese literature, Xuanzang was the inspiration for the Ming Dynasty vernacular novel known as The Journey to the West, or Monkey. Some of you may have heard of that. The protagonist in this novel of fantasy has no resemblance to Xuanzang, the real person, but attests to the saintly status of the monk in popular imagination. The second individual I will discuss is Wu Zhao, also known as Wu Zetian or Empress Wu, a devout Buddhist, she implemented Buddhist ideology to found the Zhou dynasty. Some scholars consider that an interregnum 
in, uh, within the history of the town as a Buddhist state and was a major sponsor of Buddhist monuments and artifacts. The Buddhist scholar, Tim Barrett, who recently retired from SOAS at the University of London, wrote a thought-provoking book called The Woman Who Discovered Printing. And the woman referred to in this book is none other than Wu Zhao. We will begin with Xuanzang. He made an arduous journey to India in search of authentic Buddhist teachings and to visit sacred sites. The solid line on the map indicates the route of his journey, starting from Chang'an, the Tang capital, uh, which probably is outside of the map uh, to the east, through the desert of Central Asia, around India, and then back to China again through the desert region of Eastern Eurasia. When Xuanzang returned to the Tang capital in 645, his Spain preceded him. He brought back 657 volumes of Buddhist sutras, 150 pallets of the Buddha's relics, and seven statues of Buddha images made of precious materials and were copies of fa famous Buddhist images in India. This detail from a later bi pictorial biography shows the procession of the trophy items through the capital. Monks and spectators lined along both sides of the street to receive them. Xuanzang's return to Chang'an also marked the Buddhist transformation of the Tang capital architecturally, culturally, and aesthetically. Emperors, princes, and aristocrats sponsored the buildings of Buddhist establ establishments all over the capital, with multi-story Buddhist pagodas transforming its skyline. Inside the monasteries, famous painters decorated the walls with Buddhist subjects, while craftsmen fashioned Buddhist images that filled the Buddha halls. In the southeastern section of the capital, the Ci'an Monastery was dedicated in 648 by Li Zhi, Crown Prince and later Emperor Gao Zong, in memory of his deceased mother. It was also built to honor Xuanzang, to house the Buddhist sutras he brought back and to support his translation work. Its Da Yan Ta, or the Large Wild Goose Pagoda, was the tallest building in the capital. With later restorations, today it still stands at 64 meters. Later, when the grand, even grander seeming monastery was completed in 658, he moved there to continue his work. Although he was frequently summoned to the court and also undertook his translation work elsewhere, more quiet than the capital city. Court-sponsored translation bureaus were located inside these great monasteries. Now we have to understand without the imperial support, such translation projects would not have taken place altogether. The translation bureau led by Xuanzang included some 50 scholar monks selected from the capital and surrounding regions to assist him. As soon as the sutra was translated, it would be hand copied in multiple examples and then distributed to other monasteries for study. Examples of such copies brought to Japan by returning pilgrim monks have survived in large numbers. And on the screen, you can see an example. Xuanzang's biographies mentioned that toward the end of his life, he instructed his disciples to dedicate images in the millions. Since Xuanzang's return to the capital, he was hailed as a hero and received all kinds of gifts from emperors and aristocrats. But he asked to spend all of them for the construction of pagodas, for copying scriptures, for, or making Buddha images for the benefit of the country, or for alms to the poor as well as to foreign monks and guests. He made a vow to make 10 kotis, one koti, is the equivalent of 10 million of images of the Buddha, which was accomplished. Another document mentions that shortly before he died in 664, 
He instructed his disciples to completely donate all clothing and other belongings in order to make 100 million images. 100 million may be a hyperbole, but the idea is that of a vast number. The passages also remind us of the notion of charity developed in the West in Elizabethan times. Since the mid 19th century, hundreds of clay, very small clay tablets have been found around the Dayan Pagoda and a few other sites in Xi'an. Since Zi'an Si was one of the key places associated with Xuanzang, the finding of these clay tablets confirmed the monks' vow to dedicate, quote, millions, unquote, of images. Scholars have characterized these clay tablets into several types. One type is called Shan Ye Ni, married clay or good karma clay tablets because the reverse side of the tablet is stamped with a four-line inscription that can be translated as good karma clay tablet of the great town, imprinted with the marvelous physical form of the Buddha that captures his suchness or essence. In Western scholarship, sometimes these clay objects have been referred to as votive tablets. However, this can be misleading because votive tablets or ex votos were used in Greek, Roman, Catholic, and Orthodox Christian traditions as votive offerings to a divinity or a saint after fulfillment of a vow. The Buddhist clay tablets here were made to produce merit for future benefits, not in gratitude of past bless blessings although Buddhists also uh, would dedicate um, objects after fulfillment of a vow as well. The good karma clay tablets are flame shaped with a pointed or round top and flat bottom. And there are three subtypes within this group. Types A and B vary in small details, I won't burden you with that, but share the same image of a seated Buddha with his right hand pointing down, we call that the earth-touching gesture, referring to the Buddha calling the earth to witness his victory over Mara, the moment of his achieving enlightenment. In type C, the Buddha is seated with both legs pendant, such as the way we sit nowadays. Another major group is the so-called Indian Buddha image clay tablets because the inscriptions on the verso self-identifies the image as Hindu for self, or Indian Buddha image. There are also various shapes and types within this group. For the time being, I will only focus on the tablets that feature an image of the Buddha in earth-touching gesture in both groups, namely the Shanyani and also the Indian Buddha image. Examples of Buddha images with this particular hand gesture, uh, hand gestures are very important in Buddhist sculptures because they uh, represent symbolic meanings, right? So we call that iconography. So this type of Buddha images can be found earlier in, uh, in Buddhist narratives from, Gandhar from the Gandharan region in northwestern India, or on steles depicting the Buddha's life events from the Gupta period. However, the image of an individual icon displaying this particular hand gesture without a narrative context was prominent in India only from about the 6th and 7th centuries, about the time Sun Zhang visited India. And it coincided with the emergence of Bodh Gaya in northeastern India, the place where the Buddha gained enlightenment, and it became a major pilgrimage site, along with the rebuilding of the Mahabodhi Temple, which included a, a, a main statue with this iconography within the temple. The Buddha in earth-touching gesture is therefore a specific iconographic type referring to that particular moment of the Buddha gaining enlightenment, and furthermore, the particular statue enshrined within the Mahabodhi 
Mahabodhi Temple at Bodhigaya. As a result, it became a famous icon in the Buddhist world. We call that the Bodhigaya type. Later, small clay plaques or tablets or miniature stupas from South and Southeast Asia often feature the famous Mahabodhi temple with the signature statue seated inside. And I, on the screen, you can see a couple of examples. As for the Indian Buddha image clay tablets, before the seventh century, India was referred to in Chinese uh, as Tenju or Shandu. The use of the term Yindu to refer to India be began with Xuanzang. Xuanzang was very remarkable because he retranslated a lot of existing uh, Sanskrit terms using different translations. So Yindu is one of the terms that is associated with him. And therefore, we can place the Indian Buddha image tablets to after Xuanzang's return. Below the, Bud Below the Buddha is the stamped impression of a verse that reads, all dharmas arise from a cause. The Tathagata, namely the Buddha, has explained their cause. The cessation of the cause of these dharmas, this is the great Shramana, has explained. So just in four lines, this verse came to encapsulate the entirety of Buddhist teachings at that time, which is why this verse is so uh, important. So the presence of these clay tablets along with this particular formula called dependent origination formula can be attributed to Xuanzang's uh, uh, contribution uh, when he returned to China, namely the most current uh, image type and also the most current teaching uh, in Indian Buddhism. In records, oh, I'm sorry. In records of the Western world, Xuanzang wrote, there is a practice in India of making incense powder into paste to make small stupors five or six inches tall. People write pieces of scripture and place them in the, in the interior. They call this Dharma Sarida or Dharma Relic or Relic of the Buddhist Law, implying that the Buddha's word the Dharma is equivalent in importance to or can replace the physical bodily relic of the Buddha. The appearance of the Buddha in earth touching gesture on these clay tablets along with the de dependent origination verse, as I just mentioned, attests to Xuanzang's role in introducing both the new image type, the practice of Dharma relic, along with the new teaching uh, in Buddhist doctrine to the town capital. Pressing clay into molds to capture an image or short inscriptions repeatedly and inexpensively made possible the endeavor to create millions or simply a large quantity of these objects. However humble they may look, these clay tablets were clearly evidence of one form of mass production. In terms of figural style, the image on the Indian Buddha image tablet has a slightly broader, fuller torso when compared with the Buddha image on the merit clay tablets. The style clearly deviates from contemporary Chinese Buddhist art, and therefore the term Indian was used to designate its foreignness. The small slender Buddha figure of the merit clay tablets is consistent with the figural form that has been current in China since the beginning of the 7th century, which references the classic Gupta style of the 5th century. There's a very long time lag transmitting one style to the other, not like today, right? The Amitabha Buddha in the Western Pure Land mural in Dunhuang Cave 220 in the center, it dates to 642 and it already approximates the well-known Sana prototype. The Buddha figures of the merit clay tablets, even though slightly more elongated, still belong to the same style, but perhaps 
refined with courtly elegance and decorative elements. The seated Buddha in the Indian Buddha image tablet has a slightly broader and shorter torso. If the style looks unlike the classic Gupta style of Sana from the 5th century, it is closer to the 6th and 7th century Buddha statues from Sana and Bodhgaya that evidently have incorporated the more robust features from Mafra sculpture as well as the earth touching hand gesture, a kind of a new iconography. Therefore, what was Indian about these Indian Buddha images is that they represent the introduction of a more current sculptural idiom and iconography from India that supersedes an earlier Tang Buddhist figural style derived from the Sana prototype. The rounder and broader torso can also be seen as a harbinger and a catalyst for the fuller Tang figural form of the latter part of the 7th to early 8th century with plenty of examples from gilt bronze to stone sculptures, including the magnificent Buddha statue in Sokuram Cave Temple in the Korean Peninsula, dating to the mid eighth century. Key examples of this sculpture that uh, come from a group of reliefs. Uh, they're recovered from the Qibao Tai or Seven Treasures Tower, which date to 703 and 04 and relate to Wu Zhao because the donor's inscriptions, all of them mentioned they were dedicating the sculpture to her uh, during her time, uh, towards the end of her life. So these sculptures are representative of, uh, of the courtly style of her time. And this also exemplifies the Tang international or cosmopolitan style because they were emulated in Korea and Japan. Wu Zhao was an extraordinary figure, like Queen Elizabeth II, right? She became the first and only female ruler in Chinese history. The strategy to achieve this was multifaceted, including selection of passages in Buddhist sutras that include prophecies of a ruler in female form, association with Chakravata, the wheel-turning or universal monarch in Buddhist kingship, invocation of the future Buddha Maitreya and Messianic beliefs, deployment of cults of relics, dharanis, and deities for state protection, creation of a network of state Buddhist monasteries, expansion of the functions of palace chapels and the participation of Buddhist monks in state affairs and also the patronage of Buddhist monuments, images, and rituals. Leaving Chang'an, she made Luoyang to the east, the me divine metropolis. Within the imperial palace, the most audacious religious political complex she built was the Tiantang Mingtang complex. A colossal Buddha statue in dry lacquer was placed inside the multi-story Tiantang, or Celestial Hall. The complex later suffered wind and fire damages and did not last very long. The Mingtang, very famous, or Bright Hall, was the quintessential religious political structure of traditional Chinese kingship based on ancient ritual traditions. It is described as a building with a square base and a round roof surrounded by a round moat. The structure is embedded with cosmic symbolism, and the king performs ceremonial circumambulations to harness cosmic energy and to achieve harmony between the world and the universe. Wu's architectural complex made a statement about her status, both as a rightful Chinese ruler and as a Buddhist universal monarch. She lavishly sponsored Buddhist art and monuments. Even when she was still consort to Emperor Gaozong, she was already the principal driving force behind the carving of the colossal statue of Varochana at Longmen, which was completed in 675. Varochana, or the Buddha of Great Illumination, was the transcendent principal Buddha of the Avatamsaka, or flower ornament doctrine. 
introduced to China since the 5th century, Avasamsaka Buddhism became the chief doctrine linked to Buddhist state ideology in China and elsewhere in East Asia. As his principal deity, a Vairochana Buddha presides over all other Buddhas in the universe, which is an apt metaphor for a ruler presiding over a vast empire. In addition to the Longman Buddha and the dry lacquer colossal statue I just mentioned, she also proposed to cast another colossal Buddha in bronze, but the project was not realized because of the oppositions from her ministers, complaining that it would cost too much. However, her endeavors likely inspired the casting of the colossal Vairochana Buddha in Japan, placed in the Great Buddha Hall of Todaiji, or Great Eastern Temple, and was dedicated in 752, about half a century after Wu's time. Todaiji in Nara was the headquarters of the network of state Buddhist monasteries in Japan, similar to the state monastery system that Wu founded. Shomu Tenno, or the sovereign, was the Japanese ruler who endorsed Avatamsaka Buddhism and instituted Buddhism as a state religion. Later, her daughter, Koken Shotoku Tenno, also ruled as a Buddhist sovereign. Because her second reign, uh, during her second reign, she was already a nun, a scholar speculated that she would have shaved head when she ascended to the throne. Wu Zhao's reign represented another high point in translation activities. The first high point was, of course, associated with Xuanzang, but now it's another high point. Along with the translation of many sutras newly brought to China, she supported new translations of specific ones important for state Buddhism, notably the Flower Ornament Sutra and the Golden Light Sutra. The Golden Light Sutra was very important because the four heavenly kings would protect the state and uh, the kings would be uh, mentioned in this sutra. These sutras not only convey the principles of Buddhist kingship, they were also worshipped as magical objects that had state protecting properties. Transmitted to Japan, the imperial scriptorium there, funded by Shomu's queen consort, Komeo, had these sutras copied in gold or silver ink and often on luxurious indigo dyed paper. The material opulence attests to the courtly and aristocratic character of patronage of Buddhism as a state religion. In China, Korea, and Japan, Buddhist sutras were copied in multiple copies and then distributed or lent to monastery to disseminate read teachings. It would not be too long before printing would be invented to assist in the dissemination of Buddhist doctrine. Court women and nuns were active in the, in, in the courts of both Wu Zhao and Kuomeo uh, over in Japan. For example, the Buddhist nun uh, Zhi Yun uh, from the palace convent, together with a eunuch, uh, dedicated the cave of 10,000 Buddhas uh, at Longmen in 680 for Gaozong, Empress Wu, and their offsprings. During Wu's reign, a number of transformed Avalokiteshvara bodhisattvas were introduced and became very popular. Avalokiteshvara is the bodhisattva of compassion, popularly known in Chinese as Guanyin or Kanon in Japanese. If you still own a Canon camera, it's named after Kanon. Okay? Um, with influence from Hindu deity cults, the transformed bodhisattva in different forms feature multiple heads and multiple arms to signify their superhuman powers. Here we see examples in mural paintings and reliefs in cave temples. Large-scale wall paintings in cave temples or monastery very likely were products of male painters and their workshops. But there are records of women making Buddhist devotional artworks in the medium of embroideries traditionally a craft associated with women. Historical documents mention Wu Zhao ordered the making of 400 
embroidered Buddha images at one occasion and 1,000 embroidered images of 11-headed Avalokiteshvara to commemorate the death of Emperor Gaozong, her consort. These large-scale undertakings were likely made at an imperial workshop. Court women and nuns also made Buddhist embroideries as devotional objects. The embroideries mentioned in the documents no longer exist, but the discovery of a staggering amount of objects beneath the pagoda of the Faman Monastery in 1986 included embroideries that most likely were offerings made by Wu Zhao. Faman Si is located to the west of Chang'an, famous for its possession of the Buddha's finger bone relic that had been the focus of an imperial cult of relics from the 6th through the 9th century. On a number of occasions, the finger bone relic was brought to the court for worship, and it received numerous luxurious objects donated by members of the court over the centuries. And I urge you to Google, find out what were found inside uh, the, uh, the crap beneath the pagoda. Among them, a cushion for seated meditation and an upper garment in miniature size are among the gifts very likely donated by Wu Zhao. And they are embroidered with threads wrapped with gold leaf on red silk. From the Dunhuang Library in Northwest China, we have examples of embroidered Buddha images, such as the one on the left. A magnificent large embroidery has survived in Japan, showing a Buddha preaching to a large assembly. Scholars have debated whether it was brought to Japan from China or were made in a workshop in Japan in the early 8th century. One Japanese scholar notes that such a work of this scale and quality is only achieved at an imperial workshop, such as that of Nusha. In the dissemination of Buddhist art forms, the use of stencils and model books were important means to convey both style and iconographic correctly. In the famous Horyuji near Nara, when the main buildings were rebuilt after a fire, a cycle of wall paintings inside the image hall were completed about the same time, around 710 to 711. One of the 12 mural panels feature features a standing image of 11-headed Avalokiteshvara. At Horyuji, the discoveries of identical bodhisattva images, because among the murals there are many bodhisattva images, in another building, in the pagoda, under layers of paint, confirms that war murals in those days were transferred mechanically by means of stencils. This method facilitated the direct transfer to Japan of Chinese war paintings in full size. In China, Central Asia, and elsewhere, stencils or pounces were widely used to create large quantities of devotional images and paintings. On the stencils, which can be made of paper or animal skin, the outlines of figures were pricked with needles and then charcoal dust was applied through these tiny holes, transferring the drawing to the wall surfaces. Another method of transfer is the use of tracing paper with a design. The two images of 11-headed Avalokiteshvara we see here exemplify a cosmopolitan style that originated at Wu Zhao's court. The material evidence points to the me mechanical methods through which a specific form can be copied and replicated over and over again, or transferred and duplicated in different mediums. Now we turn to the earliest printed text in the world, probably best known or already well known to those who study the history of the book and printing. The Japanese ruler Shomu's daughter, Koken Shotoku, uh, followed Wu Zhao's model as a female Buddhist sovereign. In her second reign, there was a rebellion against her entrusted healer monk Dokyo. When the rebellion was suppressed in the 760s, 
In gratitude, now this is votive rather than the, uh, for future. In gratitude, she commissioned the Hakumato Dharani or Dharani spouse of a million miniature pagodas. Again, the, the number million reminds us of uh, Xuanzang. These were distributed to various monasteries, and in modern times, hundreds have been recovered, including many from Horyuji. The printed spells encased inside the pagodas come from the Sutra of the Dharani of Pure and Solid Light, which was translated into Chinese during Wu's reign. The Pure and Solid Light Goddess is mentioned in a number of sutras, including one that alludes to the goddess receiving a prophecy to become a female ruler. Therefore, the translation of this particular text can be seen as a piece of propaganda to affirm Wu Zhao's legitimacy as a female ruler. The Dharanis or spells in the text advocates that worshippers who recite the Dharanis can gain long life, have the sins expiated, and be relieved from the sufferings of hell. In 1966, a printed Dharani from the same text was found underneath the pagoda of Bugoksa in South Korea, which was constructed in 751. The print has received much attention because it was thought to predate 751, making it the earliest extant specimen of a printed text in the world, although now the consensus is that it is likely a later replacement. My earlier discussion of the mold press clay tablets created in Xuanzang's time provided the prototype technology for mass reproduction. Spurred by the efforts to accrue merit by making images on the orders of millions. Because of the frequent contacts between China and Japan, clay tablets were transmitted to Japan as well. But there, they were not made as individual units. Instead, losing the flame shape, but modified into the rectangular form, they were repeatedly stamped as identical units on the surface of clay tiles. And such tiles were used to decorate the interiors of Buddha's halls, Buddha halls and pagodas. The introduction of clay tablets to Japan and the subsequent translation and repurposing of them represents an interesting episode in this interregional exchange. The further development in Buddhist ideology at Wu Zhao's court and its dissemination to the neighboring countries of Korea and Japan finally provided the context and conditions for the realization of the printing technology, no matter which country was the first in producing a printed work. Do I have another two minutes? You have another few minutes. Okay, then I will give my epilogue. <laughs> if time is out, then I will stop here. So as an epilogue, I return to the materials, very rich materials, uh, found from the Dunhuang Library beyond Wu Zhao's time. Here we find ample evidence of the connections of religious practice to innovations in technology. The painted scroll on the left records a devotee's recitation of Buddha names, which is part of the ritual confession of sin, and can also be a devotional act. The Buddha images are painted, identified by the names which, which are written. On the sheet of paper on the right are stamped images of the Buddha, along with the notation of dates. You will see some characters here and there. They indicate a worshiper's daily record of devotional acts, meaning on this day I have to stamp this many images. When I finish, I write down the date, and then I continue on the next day. By the 9th and 10th centuries, large quantities of printed images of devotional deities have been found. They are far less expensive than the individually painted images on silk. Most popular were Avalokiteshvara, Guanyin, Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, and Heavenly King of the North, uh, who is associated with state protection. They were worshipped as protective deities for oneself and for the country. The well-known Diamond Sutra, the earliest extant printed book in the world, dates to 868, uh, probably well-known to many of you. 
is also recovered from the Dunhuang Library. In her discussion, Frances Wood reiterates the physicality of the printed scroll as a talismanic object that has, that has magical powers. I hope that in this talk I have demonstrated how mass production and the technology of printing developed alongside the Buddhist practice to accrue merit through making images and texts. In Taoist practices, printing talisman for protection or ingestion, you can eat them, provides additional evidence. But that will be subject for another occasion. Thank you. <laughs> material which has some familiar aspects but at least for me many many new aspects too. Um, I'd be happy to moderate questions for Professor Ron. We have a little time. Barbara. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that wonderful work. And here comes the microphone. <laughs> Thank you so much for that splendid talk. Uh, just wonderful to see all this material and hear you talk about your expertise. I, I have a question. Um, I've noticed um, in other, like in, in all kinds of identifications of these early uh, statues of the various Buddha families, that sometimes um, they're identified as being one family. But the my question really has to do with the mudras because you know in contemporary study there are often like Amitabha always is seated with the bowl of nectar as it's seen in the stamped image. Yes. But you showed an earlier slide of Amitabha, like it was a completely different mudra. Um, and so I don't work on this period. And I'm just really curious, did the, was there a variation in how these, because like it's very fixed now and how these uh, Buddha families are represented. And could you talk a bit about how that varied? Because this is something I'm really curious about um, and I, I've been wondering for a very long time. Okay, thank you. When you mention Buddha families, I, I immediately think of the more later esoteric tradition where you have like mandalas and portraying different families of the Buddhas. And so that would be a much more developed state. Uh, in the early kind of, a, I'm more familiar with East Asia, East Asia, East Asian Buddhist art, the uh, symbolic hand gestures is to convey meanings. The most popular ones, including the Buddha preaching, you know, the two hand gestures preaching, no fear, okay, uh, fulfillment of wishes, meditation, and so on. So in terms of Amitabha, if you want to portray, a, a, Amitabha is the Buddha of the Western Pure Land, or, you know, infinite light. When you want to present him as preaching in the Western Pure Land, then the Buddha would be portrayed with a preaching gesture. But if you later in, the, in Japan particularly, when Amitabha Buddhism was uh, interacted with esoteric Buddhism, you will find Amitabha with a meditation gesture. So the gesture changed according to the context. Because ultimately, gest gestures are symbolic uh, methods of conveying meanings. And when the context change, the iconography can change. Thanks, Dorothy. Just a follow-up question. How, so how do we know what Buddha it is if the gestures are always changing? Is there anything that's fine that I'm really curious about? That, 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 that is a very good question. Yeah. But there are also other indications. For example, you see the Buddha seated with both legs pendant. Mm -hmm. in, in China, I'm talking about China particularly, they, they, uh, they usually are identified as the Future Buddha Matre. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Okay. Please, in the back, right here, straight back down. Yep. I will leave you to my voice from there. Thank you, that's fascinating material. Um, so, my question is in the cons consecration of the mass produced objects. So, if there are so many of these things, is there a ritual or a dedication or something conveyed by the originator? Or is the um, spiritual aspect in the uh, belief of the receiver? Or is there another paradigm 
that governs the consecration and the um, belief around these objects. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for your for your uh, question. Uh, as I mentioned in the, in one of the aspects, the um, uh, the use of these miniature stupas or plaques placed around pagodas have been around long before Xuanzang's time, you know, basically since the second century of the common era. So the early scholarship often talked about how placing these objects around the site of monasteries and pagodas as a way to kind of a consecrate. Uh, consecrate meaning, you know, it's a ritual to make the place kind of a sacred. But nowadays, actually, particularly for the ones we, uh, we study today for the clay tablets, the, the notion of consecration was not there. So I think we have to look carefully at the archaeological records and different contexts. It may be the case in some instances, but the ones uh, at the Chang'an capital, because we know that the Dayan Pagoda was already built, so it didn't need to be consecrated after Xuanzang died. So his, uh, his uh, dedication was to just to uh, make them and place them around the pagoda as a way to accrue merit for the future. So the notion of consecrating, using those to consecrating a site may not be the case here, but I'm not saying that it would not happen. Again, we need to be more specific about which site we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Other bit more, if, if you would, about these, um, these indigo colored papers with the silver ink and the, um, the, the red papers with the golden ink. What is, what is um, tell us if you could about the, the spiritual and royal significance of the production of these materials. Yes, that's a very good point. And, and the, the reddish color of the golden light sutra might, have, might be because it has kind of changed color. Yeah. So originally it was intended to be indigo. So indigo, um, I, I have to do research to find its origin, but we certainly know that uh, in East Asia, China and Japan, indigo is kind of like a purple color. So the purple color is considered very, very important. In Chinese Taoist tradition, purple is auspicious. And then in, in the, you know, passing that on to the Buddhist tradition, uh, when an emperor present a robe in purple color to a monk, that's a very high honor, which is why the most important uh, paper would be dyed with uh, the indigo dyed paper. And of course, further west, we know that uh, in the Byzantine Empire, the purple color was very important. Uh, especially for the um, for the emperors, princes, and also for uh, icons, let's say the Madonna and Jesus, they would be uh, wearing purple robes. So purple was a very interesting, uh, a very important color. But in the case of the Byzantine Empire, the purple color was derived from shells. And I imagine the indigo uh, in East Asia most likely would be plant-based, but. Uh, but maybe you you might know that. So I know about the use of purple dyes from the shells, but I don't know anything about, about the indigo. The yes. I, okay, all right. All. So, other questions, please. No, go ahead. Okay. Come to the microphone. Thank you. Um, every time I read or I listen to you, because I learn something new, so this question completely goes with much enthusiasm. Um, I suppose my question has to do with the culture of the book written large in China at this time. And here's why I'm asking. So, at this time, India is very, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very textual culture, which pretends in writing to be a massively oral culture, more oral than we actually are. Uh, but when you read Xuanzang, on India, you suddenly realize these guys have got books in their monasteries, they've got vast libraries, people, it's a status symbol to have books in houses and to have them printed. Um, he returned on letters back to his buddies. He's always complaining that he lost books on the river crossing. But that makes me want to ask you, what, where would one see books? 
or even more texts, sorry, not books, but texts or volumes or scrolls at this time more broadly outside of monastery? Okay. That's a that's a great question. Uh, I, I would have to say that uh, the 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 honoring of the book tradition uh, did not begin with Sun Zhang's time. In Chinese culture, of course, we have the written language since the 17th century uh, BCE from the Shang Dynasty, right? By the time of the Han Dynasty, uh, the Chinese classical texts have been consolidated into a canon. These are the classical texts like the Book of Documents, Book of Changes, the Confucius teachings, and so on. So along with the uh, Confucius, Confucianism being becoming the state ideology of the Han Empire, there were already creation of uh, imperial and state and regional levels of academies disseminating, disseminating the Confucian classic texts as teaching, and through learning, uh, the Chinese state government would select administrators to staff the bureaucracy. So during the time of the Tang, I talked about the translation bureaus and academies and monasteries. They were in fact side by side the state universities and academies. So on the one hand, we have the uh, continuation of Confucian teaching and academy in training uh, civil servants and uh, scholar officials. On the other hand, this is just kind of a parallel. We have the dissemination of Buddhist teachings and monks. So the, so the culture of the book uh, was already there. And we just add uh, an additional element, translating Buddhist text into Chinese and then for the monastic tradition. Stop here because we have a reception in Professor Wong Connor. I want to thank you with a little note from the staff, but also we have a small gift for you for your office, which is a framed copy of the Wonderful. poster. For you chose the, the one. Okay.